how long does it take to travel a distance? Well, I guess it depends how you travel and how far you need to travel. Uh, a long time ago, um, I did, I did a, a mini marathon. And uh, it, was, it was something about, uh, I think around two and a half miles or something. And it was a sponsored run uh, for a, a blindness charity. So that's why we were, we were running, um, we we're actually running at night. And we were running through uh, just kind of this park area. And we, we had these neon glow sticks hanging around our necks. And so I think, I think uh, it took everyone probably about maybe half an hour or so to, to finish that distance, that marathon. Now, if you were to drive across the United States, let's say from New York to San Francisco, you could probably do it in about two days if you're driving nonstop with, uh, with a friend, or maybe three to four days if you're stopping along the way to sleep. But how long would it take for someone to run from New York to San Francisco? Now, I recently heard of what's probably the longest marathon race that is actually still going on today. Now, it's called the Self-Transcendence 3100 mile race, okay? so 3,100 mile race. Now, every summer since 1997, uh, runners would actually gather at a particular neighborhood. Now, you can see it on the, on, the, uh, on the PowerPoint there on the slide. Runners would gather at a particular neighborhood in Queens, New York for the 3,100 mile race. So 3,100 miles is, a, is almost a distance from New York to San Francisco, okay? so from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. But instead of actually running to San Francisco, the runners would actually run laps around this extended block in New York. So you can see the dotted lines there that they would just run around that block for a total of 5,649 times, okay? Now they have 52 days to complete this, okay? Almost two, uh, yeah, almost two months. So they have 52 days to, to finish this. So for those of you who are kind of doing some calculations in your head already, that means running for at least 60 miles per day. So those who are participating in this, they would, um, they would probably run for about 18 hours a day. And then for the last six hours, they would use that for maybe washing up or caring for their, their bodies, or whatever's aching or whatever, and sleeping. Okay. So for 52 days, they would do this. And uh, so those who would actually win this race, the winners of this race would actually take probably less than 52 days to finish. All right. So I don't know, to me, it just sounds kind of boring just running around a lap like that many times. Now, recently, uh, I think we all, we've all heard of NASA's uh, successful landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars. Now, if you watch the landing video, everyone at NASA was so happy that this rover touched down on the surface of Mars. The distance to get to Mars is uh, a long 300 million miles from Earth. Now, the spacecraft of the rover was traveling that the, uh, the rover was traveling in was going at I think over 24,000 miles per hour. So the journey took about seven months to complete. So usually the further the distance, the longer it would take to travel that distance. But you know sometimes even short distances can take a very long time to travel. Sometimes we can't even travel 14 inches. Now what's 14 inches? 14 inches is about the length between the mind and the heart in an adult. Uh, someone once said that the heart and the mind has the shortest distance, but the longest journey. In other words, it can take sometimes a very long time for what we believe up here to make its way down here. In today's passage, we're gonna meet a man whose beliefs uh, haven't quite made the journey from his mind to the heart. So uh, turn with me to Acts chapter eight, and we're gonna uh, start reading from verse one and go to verse 25. So just follow along here. Acts chapter eight, Saul approved of their killing him. So this is uh, continuing on from uh, Stephen's, uh, Stephen's death. 
On that great day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and pro proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came away from many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, and so there was great joy in the city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed uh, Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were, they were baptized, both men, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers uh, there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Peter saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles, sorry, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. And Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me that nothing you have said may happen to me. After, uh, after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord they te and testified about Jesus, Peter and John re returned to Jerusalem and pre preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now, last week, uh, we looked at Stephen's life and death. Those who opposed Stephen, uh, you know, some regular Jews at first, and later on the Jewish leadership who sentenced him to death, uh, they were hoping to stop, to put a stop to his preaching. To them, it was blasphemous. It was heretical and offensive. In fact, for the, for the Jewish leadership, G, uh, Stephen wasn't the first to be arrested from this group of believers, but it seems they'd, they've had enough of this group and their uh, deplorable nonsense about you know, this Jesus of Nazareth. So perhaps to set an example of Stephen, they stoned him to death. So what happened after this was, uh, was persecution. People in leadership uh, Sorry. Yeah, so what happened was per, uh, persecution. We know that people in leadership need to use their influence and power re, uh, responsibly. You know, when leaders exhibit certain behaviors, cer certain ways of thinking and acting, it encourages their followers to do the same. We, we see this in politics. You know, a leader makes some kind of inflammatory comment against a group of people, and that in turn enables uh, that leader's followers to act in the same way as if it's acceptable. So these Jewish leaders, they incited persecution. And while Stephen was being buried, we're introduced to Saul, and he's a key person in the persecution of the believers. Now, we'll return to uh, this Saul guy in the coming weeks because he's, uh, he's pretty important in, uh, in the story of the gospel. But what happens as a result of the persecution is that many influential people in the church begin to leave. They leave uh, Jerusalem. The apostles, however, stay. Jesus' 12 apostles. Now, this suggests that it was probably just a particular group of the church that was being persecuted, namely those connected with Stephen and his, uh, his group. So where do they go? They go away from Jerusalem to, to Judea and Samaria. Right? Now, you need to keep in mind what's happening here. Acts 1.8, if you remember way back from then. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power, Jesus says this, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, okay, they've done that already, and in all Judea and Samaria. You know, sometimes experiencing 
and following God's purpose for your life, it isn't always a straight line. Right After Pentecost, the church, they were quite successful in, in caring for people and drawing new people in. And, you know, it seemed like it was smooth sailing. Now, I don't think anyone expected persecution to be the way that God's mission would be accomplished. Now, it doesn't mean that God caused the persecution necessarily, but it means that the tragic events like Stephen's death can never undermine God's will and God's purpose. And even when people like, uh, like Saul are forcing their way into Christian homes and, and dragging the men and women off to prison, God is still very much in control. God cannot be stopped. God is able to, uh, to incorporate these events like persecution and interruption and setbacks and tragedy to move forward his plan and purposes in the church and in your life. So now from Stephen, we move to Philip. Philip was part of this group who was put in charge of distributing uh, food back in chapter six. And Stephen was also part of them. So Philip leaves Jerusalem and he ends up in Samaria. And in his ministry, there's, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's, God uses him to, to do healings and exorcisms. You know, Philip has a very powerful ministry. And then we're introduced to a man named Simon. Now, according to Luke, Simon was a sorcerer. Now, we don't know what kind of powers he actually had, but he seems to be uh, famous. He, he seems to have a reputation for, for being someone with great power. Part of the reason he has his reputation is because, um, well, he probably gave it to himself. Right? He claimed that he was a great person and people believed it. Right? He boasted that he was a great person. So those who followed Simon regarded him as this great representative of divine power. So it wasn't all just talk. But whatever Simon, uh, the Samaritan sorcerer, did, he was able to convincingly demonstrate that he had powers. So Simon's doing his thing, and along comes Philip, who meets Simon's followers. And uh, they hear Philip preach, and they see these uh, his, his uh, powerful miracles that Philip does in the name of Jesus, and they put their faith into God and are baptized. And not only that, even Simon is impressed with Philip, recognizing that Philip uh, had some great source of power, this, this power that outstripped even his own. Simon could not deny the surpassing greatness of God, and he believed in the good news of the kingdom of God and was baptized. Now, some people think, you know, because of who Simon is and what's going to uh, happen in a moment, some people think that Simon's conversion was fake, that it was all for show and he didn't actually uh, believe in God. Now, I don't know whether we can actually say that for certain as we're not, we're not led to believe that Simon was faking his belief. Luke simply writes matter-of-factly that Simon believed and was baptized, the same way he wrote about how the other people, um, others who believed and were baptized. So I think at least we can say his conversion was, was sincere. It was genuine. Now, back in Jerusalem, the apostles hear that Samaria now has accepted the word of God. So Peter and John are sent to Samaria to affirm this Samaritan mission. The Samaritans have not yet received the baptism of the Spirit. So, uh, so the apostles, they laid their hands on the Samaritans, prayed over them, and they received the Spirit of God. Now, presumably, there was some kind of indication or event that happened where the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit you know, because Simon was impressed at what he saw. So, after Simon sees this, and go on to the next slide, Adam, um, he basically says to Peter, take my money already. All right. He asks them to give him that power to share uh, their secret with him. You know, thinking, I don't know, maybe thinking that it's, it's, it's some kind of illusion or trickery. So he wants that power so that he can be great like he used to be. And so he offers to buy their secret. What's the secret of this power? He wants it. 
Now, Peter knows the answer to that. And Peter says to Simon, he says, may your money perish with you. Now, I think the way it's written in the Bible, it, 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 it's, it sounds too nice. What's actually happening is Peter is actually rebuking Simon. Now, Peter has had some experience of being rebuked himself, right? So he, he knows how to rebuke. So what Peter is, is essentially saying to Simon is this. Peter essentially is saying to Simon, to hell with your money. Okay? He says it in, in, in a pretty strong way. Right? And so Peter can see, and, and, and so can we, uh, he can see that Simon's heart isn't right. It's, 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 it's not pure. It's not right. And the only way he will truly understand this amazing story of Jesus and be transformed by this message is if he repents. If he completely turns away from his old sinful ways of seeking glory. Only then can Simon truly and genuinely serve and love God and, and, and I would say even understand God. But as it stands right now, Simon is full of bitterness and he's captive to sin. Now these words, bitterness and captive to sin, they're, they're ideas from the Old Testament that have to do with turning away from a relationship with God. So Simon believes, but there's something in his heart that hasn't yet kind of grasped that message. And so you look at Simon's answer. He says, pray to the Lord for me that, 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 that nothing you have said may happen to me. Maybe he's nervous. Maybe he's afraid. He says, pray that it doesn't happen to me. And Peter's already told him how to deal with his bitterness and sin, but I don't know. I, for me, Simon doesn't seem to really take that on board. And so we don't know what happens to Simon afterwards. Maybe it's intentionally left that way for, for us to consider what would happen to him or what happens or, or, or what our role is supposed to be, how we would respond. The heart and the mind has the shortest distance, but has the longest journey. You know, it does matter what you believe. But with our relationship with God, it doesn't only matter what you believe. Simon believed, and as Peter points out, that belief had not yet traveled to his heart. The heart is this, this, uh, the metaphorical center of the person. This is the, the seat of your emotions, your motivations, your desires, your will. Simon was more interested in his, his own personal gain than in being like Christ. Simon was more interested in power and glory than in developing a relationship with God. He was more concerned with, about not being punished than about getting right before God. Knowing something in your head and knowing something in your heart are two different things. You may appreciate something in your, in your head. You may confess something that makes sense in your head. You may even agree with something in your head. But even with all of that, your heart can still not be right with God. I remember talking with someone a long time ago about his relationship with God. You know, he, he, at that time, you know, he, he came to church with his family but he was, he was never really invested in church. And eventually he stopped showing up to anything church related. And in our conversation, I could see that he, he, you know, he, he seemed to believe in God. There was room for God in his head. But there didn't seem to be room for God in his heart. And then after our conversation, he, he thanked me for, for talking with him. And he assured me that he will always believe in God. But he'll worship God in his own way. You know, the problem was he wanted the benefit of calling himself a Christian, but without the need to fulfill the demands of the gospel, without the need for a transformation in his life, anything in his life to, to uh, transformation to anything in his life to follow Jesus. Often when it comes to our Christian lives, uh, it's our heart that usually needs to catch up to our heads.
But even slow transformation is not the problem. I remember someone uh, saying to me, don't be afraid of slow change. Be afraid of no change. The problem is when you reject the need to change anything in your heart. The problem is when you think, you know what, I'm, I'm all right. My life is fine. I, I believe that's enough. I don't need anyone telling me how, uh, how to live my life. The problem is not allowing God to bring the, the transformation that your heart needs in order to be more like Christ. And that's the crux of it. Being like Christ in, in mind and heart, loving God with your mind and heart. And then I think that's why Peter brings up this issue of repentance. Right? Repentance is not just saying, oh, sorry, God, and then just kind of going on uh, your own way. Repentance is about turning your whole life around, away from sinfulness within and, and realigning it with God's purpose for your life. Sin hurts your relationship with God. And so in repenting, you're saying, God, uh, my relationship with you is important to me. And I take responsibility for treating you, um, for, 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 yeah, for the sin of treating you like you don't matter. And it's getting your, 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 your life to go where God is calling you to go. And so when in repentance, that leads to change, right? In your confession to God, you're saying, God, I still sin. You know, I might know it up here, but I, but I haven't really uh, embraced it in my heart. And you know, I still struggle with sinful motives and I need help to be holy. And so when you do that, it puts you in a place, it puts you in a posture where God can work in your life and where God can take your life to shape it into the, the life that he wants for you. It's a life where there's, there, there isn't a divide between what we say we believe and how we live our lives. But where we are transformed by the deep work of the Holy Spirit to look like Christ and to be witnesses of his forgiveness and mercy and love for us.